Well, thank you, Ron, for the invitation uh, to share our experience here at Stony Brook, uh, both before, uh, during, and if you can call this after, uh, at least after the initial COVID-19 spike. Uh, my name is Hal Skopicki, and as Ron, uh, Ron said, uh, I'm the Chief of Cardiology here at Stony Brook. Um, for those of you who, uh, who might not be uh, uh, aware of where is Stony Brook, actually let me just make sure that I have control over this. Uh, Stony Brook is out here in New York. Uh, that's that part of the, the coast that the uh, West Coast is trying to get rid of. Uh, New York itself, when I talk about Stony Brook being in New York, this is where everybody thinks about New York. Uh, this is not Stony Brook. Stony Brook is out here on Long Island, uh, uh, east of New York City, uh, and uh, it's got a lot of very interesting features. If you go ahead and you take a look at Long Island, the North Shore is where the wine countries are, and the South is where the Hamptons are. Uh, if you go a little bit uh, further to the west, uh, this is Ron's house. It's actually quite beautiful. Uh, I invite everybody to, uh, to make a trip over there. And when you take a look at the population of our county, Suffolk County there in the orange, it's 1.5 million people. Uh, if we combine Suffolk County with Nassau County and the two boroughs right to the next of it, Nassau and Queens, Together, Long Island would form uh, one of the largest states uh, in the United States and actually be close to the top 100 uh, largest countries in the world. Uh, when we take a look at Stony Brook, Stony Brook is situated right there in the middle of Suffolk County. Uh, it's a large hospital. It's actually the largest in Suffolk County, uh, the only tertiary uh, care uh, facility out there. Uh, over 600 beds, and uh, we usually win awards for our cardiology care. Um, when you take a look at uh, our staff and our faculty, we've got lots of cardiologists. Uh, we see nearly a quarter of a million patients in the outpatient setting each year, and about 30,000 run through our emergency rooms. Uh, we like to think our process, which is heavily based on, uh, on data, uh, is, is pretty good. Um, in the last uh, hospital compare, which looks at all, all hospitals throughout uh, the United States, within New York, we were number one for survival of heart attacks, and we were tied for first place for heart failure uh, in those hospitals that see more than a thousand patients. Uh, we have full services. Everything you could possibly imagine to take care of a heart patient, uh, we do it at Stony Brook. And for the last decade, uh, this is what I do. I get up in the morning, I go to the hospital, uh, and we take care of people. It was around the middle of December, maybe the third week in December, that uh, Susan Donnellan, who is our uh, in, uh, an infectious disease uh, expert and who also happens to be in charge of our uh, response team for international uh, issues, uh, Susan came in to our chief medical officer and said, there's a virus in Asia. We actually hear that pretty much every winter, that there's a virus in Asia and it's coming uh, over to the United States. But the second thing that she said, and again, this is way before it had, it had hit the radar in a lot of other places, she said it's bigger than MERS. MERS was a coronavirus that struck a few years back that literally sent us into a frenzy. Um, we started to repair on all sorts of levels to be able to, to kind of uh, buoy ourselves against what we thought was going to be an onslaught uh, of a viral disease that was taking lives right and left. And when she said bigger than MERS, uh, everybody paid attention. And we paid attention and we paid attention, but we really didn't hear anything through December. Uh, when January came around, uh, you know, we were still thinking that this was kind of an over there phenomena, nothing that really required a lot to do. Uh, as chief of cardiology, I was busy on a daily basis trying to figure out easy things, like when patients come in with chest pain, what are the 97 steps that need to take place to take that person with chest pain, get them through the hospital process, 
get them to discharge, and then get them followed up as an outpatient. And each and every one of these required pretty much all of our waking hours uh, to try and coordinate. That was in addition to seeing patients, in addition to teaching our fellows, our residents, and uh, doing research to, to try and push the envelope for everything that was going on. But then by the end of 2019, uh, they started talking about this novel coronavirus and the fact that there was a cluster of these pneumonia cases in Wuhan. Uh, in January, everybody started to see how this was rapidly spreading. Uh, and then by the end of February, the World Health Organization said, uh, it's not just a coronavirus, uh, it's a pandemic coronavirus, and we're going to call it uh, COVID-19. The spread in New York was pretty astronomical, uh, astro excuse me, unbelievably fast. If you take a look at uh, January, February, you're not seeing cases. The first case in New York was on March the 1st. And not a month later, by April 10th, New York had more cases of COVID-19 than any other country in the world. In our first three weeks at Stony Brook, it was, uh, it was an onslaught. Um, in the first three weeks, we saw nearly 3,000 emergency room visits where patients were complaining of symptoms that were similar to COVID. Um, when we initially uh, saw those patients, we were testing them in the turnaround for test times. It, it wasn't coming back in a half an hour or two or three hours like other tests. This was taking days for these results to come back. What that meant for us is for those 3,000 people we tested, we didn't know if they were positive for coronavirus, another virus, or if they just had uh, symptoms that mimicked uh, an acute or early viral infection. At the end of the day, one out of every three of those patients who came into our emer emergency room were actually positive. And what that meant was we had patients coming in that were literally decompensating in front of our eyes. You would see a person who had a little bit of a fever and 24 hours later, they were on a breathing tube fighting for their life. But that also meant with a thousand people coming into the hospital, that about one in 10 of them was ending up on a ventilator and we had no rhyme or reason to know, predict which ones were going to, to get worse. Uh, on a little bit of the medical end, when patients came into the hospital, what the thing that all of them had in common about the ones that were getting worse was the fact that their oxygen levels in their bloodstream was low. Yet we, wish, we were used to seeing low oxygen levels in a bloodstream, 93%, 92%, 90%. But these people were coming in at 85%, 83%, 75%. And when oxygen goes that low, we immediately reach for ventilators. We immediately want to put a breathing tube into our patients to make sure that, uh, that we can get oxygen delivered into their system. The other thing that we knew about these patients was the virus was in their respiratory system. And when we put that tube in there, we were exposing everybody to their breathing, to, their, to the virus. And so we had to immediately create negative pressure rooms, rooms that would actually suck all of the potential virus out of the room into a filtration system or into the, or into the atmosphere. The staff exposure at that time was one of the most troubling things we could possibly imagine because we thought we knew that it was going to be a respiratory transmission, but we really didn't know. Potentially any surface that we touched any um, uh, door handle that we that we touched, anything that was touched, a keyboard uh, at a, a computer station, a device that was in the room for a few minutes could have been a potential source of that virus. That was the first three weeks. And what you see there is that over a thousand patients came in. And when we took a look at it just a month later, another 500 patients or nearly 500 patients had come in after that. So the onslaught was pretty dramatic in the first few weeks. This is a graphical representation, not only of the admissions on the bottom there for all of the patients to Suffolk County, 
but you can see on the top there, the number of people who are getting ventilators, again, about one in 10. So for every thousand people, we had to come up with 100 ventilators. Initially, when we looked around our hospital, we had about 60 ventilators. And when we started doing our projection, everybody stared at each other and said, where are we going to get these ventilators from? Luckily, around the same time, as people were getting sick with, with coronavirus, um, people uh, were instructed to shelter in place and to stay at home. And all of those elective procedures, all of the surgeries that needed to be done on patients, um, we started canceling them almost from the beginning as soon as we found out that there was a case in New York. What that meant were all the operating rooms and all the ventilators that were inside the operating rooms could be pulled out of the operating rooms and be used for temporary ventilation. By the time we went ahead and took all those ventilators out and then started receiving supplies from, from uh from New York State, the total number of ventilators was somewhere around 150. And as you can see from the graph, we came dangerously close to not having ventilators. If you remember around that time, we were talking about how we were going to split ventilators, how we we're going to put two people who had COVID, uh, the COVID disease, and put them on the same ventilator if the breathing parameters matched up. Everybody had started to get pretty creative around that time, uh, you know, looking for avenues uh, whereby we can make a little go a long way. In terms of Suffolk County's response uh, to COVID-19, the slide I'm showing you right now has to, is the data from Johns Hopkins, where Johns Hopkins took a look at all the boroughs around New York and New York City. You can see New York City on the top. New York City had about 25, 26,000 uh, uh, COVID positive patients at the time that, uh, that I'm showing you this data. And uh, that compares to the 40,000 that we actually had in Suffolk County. You might ask, why does Suffolk County or Nassau County have more than New York City? It's because people work in New York City, but a lot of them come home to, to Brooklyn, to Queens, uh, to Nassau County and to Suffolk County. But the thing that I'll point out to you is that last column. And that last column represents the risk of dying. And what you can see is in New York City, in the Bronx, and in Brooklyn, the chance of dying was around 10%. Yet when you look down in Suffolk County, our chance of dying was around 5%. And the question became, what did we do or what did we know that, uh, that people in, in New York City didn't? And the answer, I'll kind of cheat with you and give you the final answer was, we didn't know anything more than they did. But we found out about 10 days after they did that COVID was coming. Because the first outbreaks were in Westchester. The first outbreaks were in New York City. And being able to communicate with them and being able to prepare based on what they were telling us, based on what Columbia, NYU, Mount Sinai, Cornell, what these wonderful institutions were seeing where they were being completely overrun by the virus. That everything that they thought that they could manage, uh, controlling where the virus would be in their hospital, making sure that they split up their emergency room in half, making sure that their intensive care units for heart patients and for surgical patients were separated out. All of those things vanished in the first one to two weeks of the virus hitting New York City. They became completely overwhelmed with the number of patients and had to board patients in the emergency rooms next to each other, uh, next to themselves, uh, to, to, all, uh, to each patient. Um, what that did was provide exposure to other patients who were coming in the one out of the two out of three that really weren't COVID uh, positive. It provided exposure to their staff, to, to the nurses, to the students, to the residents, uh, and to the physicians. Uh, several close friends who, uh, who were involved in the response in Brooklyn, Queens, and in New York City actually did not survive um, uh, get, uh, catching COVID uh, during those early days uh, of the viral infection. But the fact that we had about five to 10 extra days after it appeared in New York City 
to get our ducks in a row, I think was transformative in the way that we were able to deal with the crisis. One of the things that we did in, uh, as a cardiology group was immediately realized that we were not going to be able to keep any of the spaces that we had for cardiology and just take care of cardiac patients. So we immediately took all of our intensive care units, all of our step down and telemetry units, everything that looked like cardiac, and we threw it into the big pot in the middle and said, whichever critical patients need this space, those are the patients we're going to take care of. All of our cardiologists signed on for extra shifts to be able to, to deal with completely non-heart issues. Our fellows, the ones we've been trained to become cardiologists, became attendings in internal medicine and attendings in critical care medicine. Our interns, the ones that had started just six, seven months before, were deputized. You know, we called them uh, battlefield promotions to become those people who would be taking care of the most critically ill patients because all hands were on deck. And most of all, and we'll talk a little bit about that, it was the nurses that stepped up. The nurses who had critical care experience, some of them who had been to, uh, to war in foreign countries, uh, they were the ones who kind of helped us organize ourselves literally within a span of about 72 hours to be able to effectively deal with what had overwhelmed a lot of other locations. FEMA um, has a policy in place for those, uh, those situations when there's a critical issue. Um, it's called a hospital incidence command structure, and this is basically what it looked like at Stony Brook. Um, the key points in a hospital incident command structure is going to be the structure of it and the way that it communicates. So for a hospital, that means taking care of patients, the medical operations, the day-to-day, -day, how do I make people better, and uh, how do we triage and manage those patients, that becomes the forefront. There's a nursing operations point that we put into our hospital incident command where the nurses get to tell us what the issues that they're facing are. And engineering, how did we go ahead and get all of those rooms prepared to deal with patients who are, uh, had COVID, uh, who are coming in who either had COVID or we weren't sure and we needed to put them in kind of a no man's land. And finally, uh, and kind of novelly, I think, at our institution, we in our hospital incident command structure put the patient experience, what the patient was going through. I'm not going to have a lot of time to go through that, you know, uh, for the sake of getting everything in, but I can't begin to tell you that seeing things from the point of view of the patient, the patient who comes in not knowing what's going on, we shut down the hospital so no family members could, uh, could get into the hospital. With a thousand patients coming in, in literally in, uh, in a three week period of time, you can imagine we weren't reaching for the telephone to update every family member about what was going on. So having an advocate for the patient experience very, very early in our structure, I think was transformative in what we learned about the patients and how we were be uh, best able to manage them. We had a planning group. We had to know what was the next unit that was going to be opened up. Do we have enough equipment? Do we have enough personnel to be able to staff that, uh, uh, that uh, ward or that area or that, uh, that unit? Um, what were the shifts like in that unit? Were they going to be able to do two shifts in a row, three shifts in a row? Who needed sleep? Who didn't need sleep? How are we going to find more ventilators? Where was our personal... Uh, protective equipment coming from. All of these questions that had to do with making the hospital run uh, were dealt with in that planning group. We had a logistics group. How do you get stuff into the hospital? How do you get people out of the hospital? How do we set up testing? Do we do testing in the hospital, in the emergency room, or as we decided to do, set up a forward area in a parking lot where patients come in, roll down their window, get tested, wait in their car for several hours until the test came back and decide if they need to be uh, brought into our hospital. We had a financial group. We did not know where any of this was going to get paid for. We didn't know uh, if the federal government was going to step up, the state was going to step up, uh, and we had to buy things almost immediately. 
nobody had prepared nobody had prepared for uh, the amount of protective equipment that was going to be necessary in that initial onslaught. And then we had a media group and the purpose of the media group was to try and give as much truthful information that would inform people of what they should be doing and what was happening. Uh, and we'll get to that uh, uh, also a little bit in a little bit. From a hospital po uh, point of view, I mentioned to you daily issues. So we had a daily meeting that took exactly one hour, not a minute over one hour, where we were able to go through about 40 different service lines, everybody reporting on what was going to, what was happening, uh, what challenges that they faced, and people chiming in with things that they could do to help out. Um, we knew we had to provide care, and I mentioned to you that forward triage area, but we had to come up with space. A thousand patients, and I mentioned to you, we have a 620 bed hospital. The numbers weren't gonna work out, so we had to take decommissioned space, we had to create uh, places in buildings, we had to turn areas that were not originally designed to take care of patients, and we had to turn that into uh, usable space. All said and done, I think we got up close to about 960 available rooms should our numbers have gone to that point. And that was just the beginning because every single thing about what we were doing created a what if scenario. What if the staff, all of a sudden, half of them came down with COVID themselves? What if, if um, we ran out of ventilators? What if we ran out of PPE? What if the guidelines from the CDC or from the White House uh, changed? What if uh, there were things going on on the state level that didn't allow us uh, to do what we needed to do? And so multiple, multiple what if scenarios in each and every part of the hospital were going on. We had to create testing. I mentioned to you that there were days turned around, uh, days would go by before we had testing or where we would get test results. So those patients who were in no man's land needed to be housed. Do you house them next to a patient who is COVID positive? Well, that's, you know, surely giving it to them. But you couldn't house them next to a patient who is COVID negative because if your patient turned out to be positive, now you've consigned that patient to catching COVID. And so um, one of the things the federal government did was send out the U.S. Army of Engineers to try and build us a temporary hospital uh, uh, that uh, could be able to handle the overflow. Uh, I'll mention to you that uh, in the design, it was designed to take those patients who didn't have COVID. It was going to be a clean hospital because there was no way to ventilate the areas and the beds would be next to each other, just like an army hospital. What we've since realized is there weren't any other patients. Almost all of the patients were COVID. And so those hospitals that went up around the country, the Javits Center, for instance, uh, actually did not get, uh, uh, get filled up to any appreciable extent. The transfer of data at, that, at those moments would have been critical at informing people what they should have been doing and what they should have been looking at. The other part of that was controlling and coordinating the message. There were things that we were talking about, nightmare scenarios, what happens if, um, that weren't for public consumption. There was also buy-in that we had to get. We were asking people to put their lives on the line, literally, not knowing what went through different types of masks, uh, how long something would last on a gown, uh, when you took the gown off with gloves on, was there a risk of contamination when you went into that space in between a patient's room and the area where you took off that gown? All of those things sparked incredible rumors almost on a daily basis. And you can imagine what the, the moms and dads groups and, uh, and your local networks on Facebook um, were saying at those times and what they were saying within the hospital infrastructure itself. For my group, for the Department of Cardio for the Division of Cardiology, um, we were all hands in. We were going ahead and saying, no matter what the patients were, we were going to take care of those patients in every way that we could. And many of us signed up. 
but the, the charge of the group in cardiology was to make sure that we were keeping our staff safe. I mentioned to you that we had 30 uh, cardiologists that expanded up to about 50 or 60 when we asked for volunteers from the community. But we knew very early on that COVID was affecting those people over the age of 60 disproportionately. And so we immediately had to uh, make a decision about whether we, gonna, we were gonna uh, protect our older people and put them out on the line. Uh, excuse me, put them out of harm's way into the outpatient setting, and which is what we ultimately did. We sent them out there with their laptops and computers, and they were in charge of taking care of patients via telemedicine. I will also tell you, though, that there was a lot of guilt about looking at that 45-year-old or that 55-year-old with perhaps a predispos uh, predisposing disease, or even the 30-year-old, the fresh out of training doctors, and telling them that they were gonna face the brunt of everything that was going on and the unknowns that we had. Communication was the key, and I'm gonna spend a couple of slides on that, but I can't begin to tell you that the flow of information was the, the key thing, remains the key thing throughout. On a personal level, I think Ron's heard a few, few of the stories, but you know, my personal protection, uh, I have a wife, I have three daughters, um, and the question was, you know, was I going to be around? And so my concept of personal protection and the fact that literally everything that I touched uh, turned into me cleaning my hands, disinfecting, and putting myself in a position where nothing was going near any part of my body that potentially could transmit the virus. Um, sleeping arrangements, when you went to sleep, you didn't know what was in the air. Yeah, you didn't know what things uh, were going on. Uh, out of the first 60 days, I actually stayed in the hospital 48 of those days, day and night, trying to make sure that I wasn't bringing anything home. Uh, when I did get home, I isolated completely from everybody because, again, our knowledge at that time was that this could be transmitted in any way, shape, or form. I won't go through all the things that we had to adapt to as a hospital, whether it had to do with the work practices, where, how the employees were being uh, managed. I will tell you one of the early things that we did was we created a space that was entirely dedicated to employee well-being, and we thought that maybe two or three people on their break would show up, and it turned out that literally dozens and dozens of people in a spatially conscious way, making sure that they were uh, they had masks on and they were away, but came there for respite and saw psychological help and the support of groups. Um, again, infection control, our business continuity and, and the communications, our supply logistics, our staffing logistics, each and every one of these had to be adapted to on an ongoing basis. I mentioned to you protecting the team. Our PPE, um, we thought was good. Uh, initially. And then as you watch the recommendations change almost on a weekly basis from the CDC, we started to understand that we really were in harm's way a lot of time. And in the hospital incident command, we didn't know oftentimes two or three days down the road whether or not we would run out of that equipment. And that we were making arrangements for doing the best we could and, the, and what we were going to be telling our caregivers. Um, the routines that we came up with um, had to be uh, communicated throughout uh, the entire groups and make sure that everybody had input into trying to optimize those routines. We created buddy systems, so you didn't go into a room without your buddy taking a look at your equipment and making sure that you were protected. Anybody want to guess where that came from? If you said diving, you're correct. One of our... One of our uh, um, uh, personnel is actually uh, does skydiving and that person was the one that said everybody has to have a buddy before they go and they see a patient to check out their equipment. We also had to make it sure that patients could, uh, excuse me, that uh, physicians and nurses could tap out without recrimination, making sure that it was okay to say I'm tired, I'm exhausted, you know, I need to, I need some rest and making sure again that we protected their mental health. 
there's a, a pretty famous diagram. Uh, it's the yurtz dodson Law, which basically goes ahead and says, this is when you put people under pressure, this is how they respond. Initially, if you don't, if they're under pressure, but there's nothing to do, everybody gets bored. But then as you start to go ahead and get them uh, uh, involved, they become very motivated and focused. I cannot begin to tell you that all of those cheers everybody was giving, we were giving internally to the, to the nurses uh, and the doctors that were doing the on-site, the, the, the pharmacists, uh, the, the people who were cleaning the rooms, the engineers, the IT specialists, uh, without any medical training coming in there and setting up these rooms in a way that uh, you know allowed us to remotely monitor patients, all new technology that was coming up on the fly. Um, that early period, everybody was incredibly motivated, incredibly focused. And then we started to feel the fatigue. I think that took place right around a month, a month and a half into it, where people were kept volunteering and volunteering. Uh, and, uh, you know, with no end in sight. We did not know when this was cr going to crest. I'll tell you on behalf of every healthcare worker in the United States, the the fact that you guys stayed at home and the fact that you were able to go ahead and uh, uh, and limit the total amount of exposures, it was a game changer. If we had had any more patients than what, what, uh, what actually ended up showing up, the system would absolutely have been overrun. And then again, we were protecting on that next level to make sure that, uh, that the exhaustion, when it set in, that we were letting people uh, get the rest that they need. I will tell you that there were definitely those of us uh, who felt anxious, who felt the, uh, the panic and the anger, and that really were there in that burnout stage. Um, I mentioned to you flow of information. It was the single most critical component of everything that we looked at because everything that happened in one part of the hospital, in one part of the county, in one part of the state, in one part of the country, the ability to exchange information was absolutely the game changer in everything that we did. Uh, on a daily basis, I mentioned to you the Hicks uh, uh, plat uh, platform. We had become a part of teams before the COVID crisis had started. Um, this is not a, uh, a product placement uh, type of thing. I had no idea what teams was. Somebody told me about it. I created about five different work groups, and then I continued sending emails to people uh, without a second thought. I text messaged people when I needed to text message them, and I had these wonderful groups of teams set up, but never, ever, ever used it. Only the IT people at our institution were using it. It became an indispensable source of information in our hospital, communication, putting things up on billboards, allowing people to go and look at the state-of-the-art protocols. We had teams that were looking at uh, new therapies that were going up uh, throughout the entire country who could post their uh, information there. We could call meetings within a few seconds and get everybody on a face-to-face -face basis. I can't tell you how transformative and even post-COVID or in this uh, lull, uh, how much it did transform our care. Um, individuals took it upon themselves to give weekly updates. Uh, we made sure that every group was uh, was represented. There was an IT update. There was a nursing update. Um, there was uh, uh, everything that you could possibly imagine that goes into running a hospital. My information also came from the lay press, and it wasn't until a little bit later on that I started to stop paying as much attention. Every time there was a White House briefing, I was turning on to see what Dr. Fauci would say and to see you know, what his recommendations were, uh, which were usually a couple of days ahead of uh, CDC guidelines. Governor Cuomo found PowerPoint and started creating PowerPoints that uh, explain what was going on in New York to the best of his ability, and we were able to see how other hospitals and other services were working. Um, there were a number of websites that came uh, that stepped up to the plate and again really allowed us to to have an understanding of how we were going to share information. Johns Hopkins almost immediately 
put up a website that showed us spread throughout not only the United States, but the world. I could find out what was going on in each and every county, and then within the county, I could look at individual cities. I was able to, to be able to track all that information in real time within 24 hours of the data being posted. There were some institutions like the University of Washington. Washington had an outbreak of cases and started mobilizing individual parts of their hospital. So we were able to copycat a lot of the things that were happening out there as we were trying to come up with structures and then make it our own and then troubleshoot it locally. Um, our county, the Department of Health, came up with statistics and we were able to really see what was going on uh, on a local level. Doctors know that medical information is lodged in something called PubMed. It's a repository for almost every medical article ever written. Those articles usually are reviewed by other doctors before it gets set up, sent into these databases. And the turnaround time from submitting an article to having it show up is somewhere between three and six months. As you can imagine, there wasn't going to be a lot of data in real time when I needed it one week, two weeks, and three weeks down the, uh, down the road, which I'll talk about in a second. Social media became a lifesaver for communication for physicians, nurses, and healthcare providers. Uh, for me personally, there was a WhatsApp set up for all doctors on Long Island, uh, all cardiology doctors on Long Island, and in the you know, almost immediately, we were sharing cases and asking, have you seen this? How have you treated it? What happens when you do this? Um, you know, what's your anecdotal experience? Because at that time, anecdote was the only thing that we had. Facebook and Reddit actually created uh, monitored groups. And uh, uh, one of the ones that we were a part of was the COVID-19 critical care group. It's by invitation only. And again, the idea of it was to share best practices and anecdotes in real time or to ask questions. And our residents, fellows, you know, became reliant on these social media forms of communication to put something out into the community and to get the best responses. Serendipitously, um, in 2019, Cold Spring Harbor, one of the leading research institutions in the country, had gotten together with the British Medical Journal and Yale and said, when people submit articles for publication, those articles go in, but it usually takes a long time for them to get out. How about if we create a website where all of those articles, those preprints, the ones that have not undergone strict um, uh, uh, evaluation, what if we put them there and let everybody know, all the doctors, all the researchers know that this is preliminary, that we're going to put up a notice that says this article is a preprint and has not been peer reviewed. It represents new medical research that has yet to be evaluated and so should not be used as a guide to the clinical practice. Would people use it responsibly? And the answer was a resounding yes. This is where we got most of our data and most of our ability to, to kind of move on the fly. We knew that it was not adjudicated, that the leaders in the field had not looked through these studies, but it gave us a direction and a way to think so that we could then um, ask the right questions. Um, in addition to that, everybody had access. So how did New York do? Well, I think you can see here from the first couple of curves that this was that first three to four week onslaught. And based on how hospitals responded, based on how the public responded, we bent that curve pretty dramatically. Right now, we are under a thousand cases um, uh, uh, on an annual, uh, excuse me, on a, uh, a daily basis. New Jersey followed suit with us. And you can see that the rest of the entire United States combined with that 30,000 COVID cases and everybody was saying it's not going to happen to them. Look, it's going away in New York. That's when they saw that second spike where, where they were lax and uh, didn't follow the things that we all knew was allowing us to bend the curve. You see that though they were able to bend their curve, but there's now a resurgence throughout uh, where things are getting a little bit worse. Um, when we took a look as of uh, June 6th, 
the number that we look at is 1%. When we get under 1%, that means you're dramatically bending the curve. It means that less than one patient is coming into your hospital for every one that you discharge. That number had gone down to about 0.25 but as I'll show you in a second, that number is right about one right now. Every patient we discharge is a patient that comes back in. So we're not out of the woods yet. What does the future hold in terms of, uh, of you know, where COVID is heading and what's going to happen? Is there going to be a second resurgence? All I can tell you is there's a huge amount of computer modeling going on. Best case scenarios where the curve has been bent all the way to worst case scenarios where we see a second rise and we have to do, do this all over again. Uh, just yesterday on the news, uh, you know, these were the screen grabs. Positivity rates where I'm telling you are less than 1% in these states is greater than 10%. Rising COVID cases, more than 60% in these states. You know, I get back to the fact that there's a simple thing to do. You know, physical distancing and wearing a mask. Uh, if you need a screen grab to show all of your friends, th the first one is, is what we did here in New York to try and bring that level down. People are getting infected, you know, at, an, at a rate that we can handle. Um, it's when we go ahead and we start to not socially distance that we start seeing those numbers, numbers going up. So what have we learned? We've learned that there's a new disease out there. Yeah, we knew about coronaviruses and we knew that they could be fatal, but we did not understand their mechanisms. Uh, I don't have time to show you this pretty dramatic thing that I saw within the first three weeks when one of uh, my friends had taken what we call a bronchoscope, which is something that goes into the lungs and it looks to see what it's there. And inside of the lungs of this COVID positive patient was this film that had lined all of the airways. But when he went to grab it with one of the, uh, one of the appliances that we use to remove foreign bodies, it disintegrated as he grabbed it and then just stuffed up the rest of the lungs. There are things about this disease that are teaching us new mechanisms. And on the bright side, it's going to teach us how to deal with other diseases that have heretofore been uh, just unreachable for our technology. The body responds in a way that we don't know. Remember those people that I told you where their oxygens were dropping down into the 85% and 83%? We were immediately putting them on breathing tubes. What we found out is the body could actually respond to that and stay at those levels of 83 and not require breathing tubes. That actually results in better outcomes than immediately rushing to put them on breathing tubes. There are new therapeutics that are down, you know, that are along the way. The, the most common thing that you hear about is that antibody, that vaccination. I think that that is going to be um, helpful, but it's not going to be the game changer. The game changer is going to be when that patient comes into the emergency room, if we have the ability after they're infected to make sure that they don't get worse, if we have something that can block the body's responses that make it worse or the virus's ability to cause the body to respond in an inappropriate way, I really think that those are going to be the game changers. I put the word Tamiflu up there because uh, it reminds me that we've been dealing with, you know, the flu for about 50, 80, 100 years. And the best that we've come up with all the science over that period of time has been a medication that will go ahead and decrease the amount of time that you have the flu by one day. We have no way of dealing with those viruses. And miraculously, since this started in January, now seven, eight months later, um, we have come up with ways to manage with steroids, um, with, uh, with other agents that can uh, uh, modulate the body's inflammatory system in a way that uh, we have not had before. And literally thousands and thousands of research studies are out there trying to find new areas. Healthcare workers, what we've realized is we, 
they need protection, but not just healthcare workers, any primary uh, responders, uh, sanitation workers that are picking up all the garbage that may be contaminated, to policemen who are uh, going into situations that they don't know, to people who have to congregate for business together. Everybody needs that protection, and there is an enormous industry waiting to be tapped to try and create those individual personal protections. We need information. I can't begin to tell you how all the healthcare workers learned that, that we're nothing when we're faced with stuff that we haven't been trained or learned to do. It's like being on the battlefield and finding out that there's a new weapon out there and you don't know what you have it works. Or, or what the experience is of other people who are meeting up with it. The flow of information is incredible. Resources, supply chains, being able to say how much of what is where. If we had been able to ship up from Alabama all of their ventilators and then give it back to them when they needed it, there wouldn't have been any reason to worry that we weren't going to be able to, uh, to manage this crisis. Removing impediments, um, expanding hospital capacities. Uh, these plans should all be in place everywhere. FEMA actually asks us to have those plans in place, but it isn't until you really test the plans that you actually find out whether they're working. Uh, in New York State, they suspended malpractice very, very early on. I'm actually glad I just realized I, I misspelled malpractice, so, so nobody sue me for that. But by suspending malpractice, people became unafraid to step in and step up. And so all hands on deck, getting the right people in and the right manpower in was only possible because of those, those restraints. Communication, um, I can't begin to tell you again, that's the key to, to unleashing the full strength of you know, the hospital, uh, the, the county, the state, uh, the United States, is making sure that everybody communicates. Communicating with the patients. We were able to go ahead and ask for donation of iPads uh, for patients who were, who were in rooms who could not communicate with their families or who we were afraid to go into their room multiple times during the day. We got thousands of people donating their iPads. IT hooked all of them up and we were able to create those communication lines. Um, the last thing that I will say to you is embracing science and data. It's wonderful to have a platform where information can be propagated. The problem is when bots or people that don't have your best interests take over and start propagating things in a way that it drowns out the science and it drowns out the data. There needs to be a way to kind of allow us to be able to go forward with data and science and be able to have those discussions, to not accept it on blind faith, but to have those discussions led by content experts open to opinions across the spectrum. So with that, I can't begin to thank you enough for giving me this platform and uh, Ron for, for inviting me to speak.